So this is Fizz 2320 Computing 2, and this is the first unit in a set of video tutorials on strings and string handling. Uh, and for students of the module at the University of Leeds, then you can download the Jupyter Notebook uh, and a PDF version of these notes from Minerva on the module pages. So the first part of this video, we'll just discuss briefly what a string is and um, how we go and define strings in Python. So strings, of course, are one of the basic types you come across in most programming languages. And, and of course, Python is no different in this respect. And they're representing a sequence of characters. Um, so that's letters, digits, punctuation marks, and in fact, other um, uh, glyphs that you could display. Um, and they're normally intended, obviously, to be interpreted as readable text in some format. But of course, internally, since computers only work in binary numbers, you have to store the string as a sequence of binary numbers, which you then use to um, decode to work out what character should go and be displayed to the user that corresponds to those particular numbers. So they become a, a sequence of, of, of numbers um, that, that eliminates all the various uh, character glyphs. So strings and string handling has been part of programming and computer science right from the earliest possible days of, of, of uh, coding. So, for example, if you go back to the Second World War and the work being undertaken at Bletchley Park um, on uh, decoding the German Enigma ciphers um, by people like Alan Turing. So uh, Alan Turing was responsible for inventing a, the, one of the earliest electronic calculating machines, the bombs which were used to go and decode uh, these text messages that were received um, being produced by the German uh, cipher machines. And so intrinsically at that point, even so, we were still, we were it, the earliest forms of, pro of programming computing were de trying to deal with text. After the war, um, computers were developed by a variety of different manufacturers. Um, and because the amount of programming uh, processing power uh, on these mach early machines was extremely limited and, and the memory even more so. It was very important to use the smallest possible range of numbers to encode the textual information. And that intrinsically meant that um, you limited what characters you could actually work with. And so most of these early computers would only work with uppercase uh, letters from the, the English alphabet, from the Latin alphabet, so A to Z, and obviously digits and a very small subset of punctuation marks. But worse than that, the coding between uh, what a letter was and what number it corresponded to would depend on which manufacturer. Um, and although they tend to agree about things like the order of the letters and the order of the digits, things like, for example, as fundamental as a space character was encoded differently. So it was uh, depending on the manufacturer. So, for example, a digital equipment corporation encoded it as the number 16, whereas an IBM encoded it as the number zero. Now, at this point, most of this development in, in computing was being undertaken in the United States. And so it was the American Standards Body which came up with a, a proposal for uh, standardizing this coding between which letters and numbers. And this became known as the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII. Um, and this mapped upper and lowercase uh, Latin alphabet um, characters, digits, and quite a number of the common punctuation marks into a range of numbers which went from 0 to 127. It also included several control characters to mark things like the end of a line or um, a carriage return or a tab character. Um, and indeed, to make the computer go beep at you as well was encoded as a character. Then other countries gradually adopted these as the as the default standard. But of course, depending on local needs, you needed additional letters or, or symbols. Um, and these were generally encoded into numbers between 128 and 255. So for example, in the UK, the British pound sign was not in the standard ASCII um, set. And so that was one of the things that was mapped in the UK into that higher range of numbers. But then in... Um, in Germany, for example, you had to also include umlauted versions of vowels. Um, in French and Spanish, you had to include additional uh, accents as well, um, as, as well as um, any other local symbols. 
Um, and then people sort of discovered other things that were going to be useful, like a copyright symbol or a trademark symbol. And these all ended up being encoded in this higher range of, of numbers. One of the advantages that ASCII had, or one of the reasons it kind of took off, was that it used exactly one byte per character. Um, and that was useful because the byte, eight bits of binary, de binary data, uh, binary digits, was um, uh, the unit in which memory was organized. Um, so your memory was organized into bytes and then kilobytes, which is 1,024 bytes, and megabytes, which is 1,024 kilobytes, and then gigabytes, terabytes, and so on. Um, and so it was very convenient if you had to represent a block of memory to represent it as a string of ASCII characters. The limitation, of course, is when you start trying to connect different computers from different parts of the world, which are trying to handle different variants of the additional sets of characters beyond the ASCII range. Um, and this became particularly um, obvious in the 1990s when computers went from being the sort of thing that just was in big companies like banks or in universities or military installations to being ubiquitous and on every single desk in every single company and, and in most homes. And in particular, as the computers were connected together onto the Internet. And at that point, it became really kind of important that you could go and handle the fact that you had different character sets being used in different parts of the world. And so a new standard was invented, which was called Unicode. And Unicode um, allows you to represent a much broader range of characters. Pretty much any single character glyph you might ever want to need, you can represent in Unicode. And it does this simply by expanding the range of numbers it uses. However, it also had to try and handle the fact that in the interim, various uh, sort of pro, pro tem solutions have been invented to try and work around ASCII's limitations. And so although Unicode in principle is nice and simple, in practice, it gets an awful lot more complicated as it tries to sort of work around all the possible standards that there have ever gone and been. And so string handling, um, when you get into the nitty grit of it, can still be really quite complicated. Fortunately for us, however, um, since version 3.0, uh, Python has adopted Unicode as its standard strings and that has made life a lot easier and means that your, your strings in Python can include um, all kinds of other characters. And in the final part of this video tutorial, I'll talk briefly about uh, situations in which you might still want to go and have um, uh, ASCII strings or strings where you're using only one byte per character um, and, and how you can translate to and from Unicode to do that. So, of course, the first thing we want to go and do then is to be able to go and write a string constant in a programming language. So just in the same way you want to go and be able to express a constant number, you want at some point to be able to go and express a string as a constant. And, of course, the, the standard way one goes and does this is you um, have the string you want to represent and you enclose it in quotes. And Python actually is incredibly flexible about how you, you use your quotes. And it will let you use either single or double quotes um uh to go and encase your string and that allows you to go and for example have a quote character inside your string um you just simply have to use the other sorts of quotes to quote that string and python will work out well if i started with single quotes then this double quote isn't trying to close a string it's trying to be part of the string um or vice versa if you need an apostrophe which is the same character as a single quote you can do that as long as you start your string with double quotes and again, in a later part of this video, I'll just show you what you can do if you actually do need to go and use both types of quotes inside your string and how you can get away with that. And Python also allows you to have a um, multi-line string. So in other words, a string that you can express over many lines in your program. And that's done by using triple quoted um, quote marks. So here are the various options for um, single quoted strings. Um, so as I said, you can use either type of quotes as you like, and if you need to include one of the quotes inside your string, then you just simply use the other sort of quote um, around the outside. And triple quoting works with either single or double quotes. Um, uh, that's not a problem at all. The only thing you really have to watch out is that you do actually properly stop your, your triple quoted string. 
um, it's very easy to buy accident to miss out one of the closing quotes and start with three open quotes and then only have two closing quotes. And then you discover that, in fact, you've just made your entire program into a single string. Um, and that's generally not probably what you wanted to go and do. Um, there's a sort of um, de facto convention, I think, that more often than not, people tend to use single quotes when they're dealing with a, a single line string um, and to use double, triple quotes when they're doing a multi-line string. But there's really no um, there's there's no hard rule there. That That's just the sort of the convention that most people seem to adopt. Um, but either which way around, Python gives you this really nice way of going and expressing all the possible string constants. 